I'm here at St. Stephen's Catholic Church in Portland, Oregon. Today is the fifth day in our novena to Blessed Karl of Austria, the, known as the Peace Emperor, or the Emperor of Peace. Well, let us continue today, and today I'm going to switch over to a book called Blessed Charles of Austria by Charles Coulomb. And chapter 10 is entitled The Peace Emperor. Now, this picks up right after the uh, coronation of uh, uh, Blessed Carl. Now, just, to, just as a note here, the Charles and Carl are the same name. So sometimes you'll hear him referred to as Blessed Charles of Austria and other times as Blessed Carl of Austria, but it's the same name. It's just uh, anglicized as Charles. Upon their return to the capital, Charles and Zita had much to do. The family took up residence in the palace at nearby Laxenburg, then as now a monastery of the Franciscan Sisters of Mercy of the Holy Cross, was located close to the palace. In the Sisters' Journal for January 9, 1918, mention is made of the new imperial neighbor. Quote, The imperial court took up residence in the Blauenhof in Laxenburg, and Emperor Charles drives his car to Baden's war cabinet every day at eight o'clock and he always piously watches the window as he drives past the chapel to greet the Holy of Holies. Even today he does it that way. Now this fits well in with the traditional well-known image. The Emperor did not pass any church without saluting Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament and giving him honor. And this is what he taught his children, that they should make the sign of the cross whenever they passed by a church in the car. Now, there is a, uh, one of the reasons for that is that, and we should all do this, when we pass by a church where we know the Blessed Sacrament is reserved, that we should make the sign of the cross and gain a partial indulgence for doing so. Now, anyone who's concerned with gaining a partial indulgence or an indulgence of some uh, sort, uh, usually somebody who practices his faith as the, as the Holy Emperor did. We're just skipping, uh, this is quite a long chapter, we won't go through the whole thing, so skipping around a little bit here. At the beginning, according to Pulitzer Hoditz, at the beginning of the war, Austrian patriotism, to the amazement of a great many people, was displayed by all nationalities and by all classes of the population. It should have been carefully guarded as a most precious possession. It was military justice which destroyed it, and from the outset, the military authorities saw a traitor or an enemy in every Czech, every Serb, every Pole, and every Ruthenian. There began those senseless persecutions by means of which, aided by the supineness of the government, the secession of the non-Germans in Austria was slowly but systematically effected. The Slavs whose sentiments were Austrian, and there were a large number of them, were forcibly driven into the camp of the traitors and the enemies. For the overwhelming majority of the peoples of the old Danube monarchy, the Austrian and dynastic point of view was not an affair of the stomach, to which level Count Chernin tried to reduce all patriotism, but an affair of the heart. And this was an urgent problem for Charles, because already in 1915, various groups of exiles, the Czech, South Slav, and so on, had declared themselves the provisional governments of breakaway republics from Austrian rule. The Allies had not recognized them as such yet, and if they did so, it would make holding Austria-Hungary together infinitely more difficult and encourage Britain, France, and the rest to push through to absolute victory rather than a negotiated peace. Now, at this point, we might stop and take a look at Charles's character and personality. As we have seen, he was personally brave and very devout, a loving husband and father. But what else might be said of him? According to his wife, he was both logical and practical, with a well-developed sense of right and wrong. What this meant was that once he resolved something had to be done, he would doggedly look for ways to accomplish it unfazed by setbacks. He was not an intellectual, Rather, his empress recalled, 
he would arrive at conclusions by instinct and common sense. Despite his elevated situation, Charles's tastes were quite simple. He preferred folk music to symphonies and operas, and histories and travel books to fiction. He was much like his great uncle had been in terms of being fairly indifferent to cuisines and wines, but Charles was an avid hunter and horseman. He was particularly attentive to other people's views, attempting to understand them even if he disagreed. And as a result, when he caught someone else's point, he would say, yes, yes, giving the impression, sometimes erroneously, that he shared it. And perhaps what would become his biggest Achilles heel was his unending attempt to see the best in everyone. Of a noble disposition himself, he failed at times to see the deceitfulness in others. If anything, the incredible pressures put on him by accession to the throne and the attempts to find peace and ameliorate his people's needs made him ever more pious, and supernatural aid was needed to fund human, superhuman strength. Blessed Charles of Austria understood the veneration of the Sacred Heart and the worship of Jesus in the sacrament, not in a separate juxtaposition, but in their unity and communion. In his devotion to the Lord, he clearly had in mind the whole of Jesus' reality, and, the coexist and this coexistence in the devotion to the Divine Heart in the Eucharist will be observed more often. The two dominant dimensions of his piety were, relation, were related to the Eucharist and the Sacred Heart. In the sacrament of the altar, he knew the suffering and loving heart of Jesus to be present. For the Eucharistic Emperor, as His Excellency Fisher Colbury, the Bishop of Kosich, called him, the Sacred Heart Litany and the Day of the Heart of Jesus were among his, famous, his, among his favorite prayers. And he most definitely had a domestic agenda. At home, Emperor Charles established a ministry of social welfare, the first of its sort in the world. Its mission was to deal with such issues, social issues, as youth welfare, war disabled, widows and orphans, social insurance, labor rights, and job protection, job placement, unemployment relief, and emigration protection and housing. He commuted death sentences whenever he could and constantly urged his Hungarian ministers to enact universal suffrage in Hungary. Charles ordered rationing to be instituted at the palace, just as it was throughout the rest of Vienna. He organized soup kitchens, used the palace's horses and wagons to deliver coal to the Viennese, fought against usury and corruption, and gave away most of his private wealth by distributing alms beyond his means. He went among his people, suffered with them, and comforted them with his presence and words. His subjects called him the People's Emperor, a title he cherished more than his noble and royal titles. And on the war front, Emperor Karl halted strategic bombing of civilian populations and buildings, restricted the use of mustard gas, and was adamantly opposed to submarine warfare and the mining of harbors. He abolished the military punishment of binding wrists to ankles, prohibited duels, and forbade flogging. He decreed an amnesty for anyone sentenced by military or civilian courts on charges of high treason, insults to the royal family, disturbance of the public peace, rebellion, or agitation. And at risk to his own life, he visited the soldiers on the front lines and in the hospitals, giving all of the moral support he could and observing the fighting firsthand. As supreme commander, Karl would not send his men anywhere that he himself would be afraid to go. His trait of showing up unexpectedly at any time, anywhere, caused his soldiers to affectionately nickname him Karl the Sudden. Now, there's an interesting note here about a prophecy of St. John Bosco. So we continue here, uh, we continue here with the chapter on the peace emperor. Charles had, of course, inherited the war in which he and his country were involved. It represented the culmination of a foreign policy of which he had not approved, although he was in no position to oppose it. Although personally friendly with Kaiser Wilhelm II, 
Charles was only too aware that his friend was not really in charge. Moreover, he shared his late uncle Franz Ferdinand's distrust of Germany, Pan-Germanism, and the creation of a German-led Mittel Europa would, in Charles's eyes, be the doom of the multinational monarchy, with Austria-Hungary being progressively colonized by her neighbor. To both Charles and his uncle, a far better scenario would be an Austria-Hungary allied with France, and possibly Great Britain, and perhaps even Russia. It is interesting to note that St. John Bosco who lived from 1815 to 1888, that St. John Bosco, noted for his prophetic dreams, had one that is particularly apropos in 1873. Here's the quote from the dream. Thus says the Lord to the Emperor of Austria, be of good cheer and look after my faithful servants and yourself. My wrath is now spilling over all the nations because they want to make people forget my laws, glorifying those who defile them and oppressing my faithful adherents. Will you be the rod of my power? Will you carry out my inscrutable design and become a benefactor of the world? Rely on the northern powers, but not on Prussia. Enter into relations with Russia, but form no alliance. Join forces with Catholic France, after France, you shall have Spain. All together become one in will and action. There's the end of the prophecy. Now, according to Don Bosco's biographer, Father Amadeus, quote, this letter was sent to the Emperor of Austria in July 1873 through a Countess Lutzow, who delivered it to him in person. He read it attentively and sent his hearty thanks to the sender saying that he would avail himself of it. Now, as it happened, when this letter was sent, the as yet unborn Zita's kinsman, the Count de Chambord, was in negotiations with the then pro-royalist French government to be restored to the throne as Henry V. And in the end, he refused, fearful that he would be a mere figurehead. But who knows how things might have gone had Franz Joseph offered France an alliance at that juncture. Alas, as with Louis XIV and the request for the consecration of France to the Sacred Heart, as was requested by Saint Marguerite Marie Alacoque, it did not come to pass, and unfortunately, as Charles was to discover, the France of 1917 was not the still Catholic France of 1873. I'll pause there for a moment. Interesting that he was to be restored, uh, the Count de Chambord was to be restored to the throne as Henry V. I've heard, um, I've heard of uh, various um, Catholic prophecies speaking of the restoration of the French monarch as being um, King Henry uh, the, of the Cross. Is that King Henry V of the cross? Since Henry V did not come to be. And interesting that, uh, that it is of this family of Zita, of the uh, Empress Zita. Well, I think we'll stop there for today and we'll pray our novena prayer. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Heavenly Father, through blessed Emperor Carl, you have given your church and the people of God an example of how we can live a discerning and spiritual life in a convincing and courageous way. His public actions as emperor and king and his personal acts as a family man were firmly based in the teachings of the Catholic faith. His love for his Eucharistic Lord grew in times of trial and helped him to unite himself to Christ's sacrifice through his own life's sacrifice for his peoples. Emperor Carl honored the Mother of God and loved to pray the rosary throughout his life. Strengthen us by his intercession when discouragement, faint-heartedness, loneliness, bitterness, and depression trouble us. Let us follow the example of your faithful servant and unselfishly serve our brothers and sisters according to your will. 
Hear my petitions and grant my request. Let us call to mind our intentions for this novena, and please remember in your intentions to pray for peace in the Holy Land, peace in, peace in our nation, peace in our cities, peace in our families, and in our hearts, in our souls. And for all the intentions of those praying this novena, grant the blessed Karl of Austria be deemed worthy of canonization for the glory of your name, the praise of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and for blessings upon the Church. Amen. The prayer for day five. My Lord and God, you teach us in the Our Father to forgive the sins of others, so that our sins may be forgiven. Help me to imitate the example of Emperor Karl, so that I might forgive Forgive all injustices done against me. Hear my petition and grant my request through the intercession of blessed Emperor Karl. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. God, our Father, through the gift of blessed Emperor Carl, you have given us an example to follow. In extremely difficult times, he performed his burdensome tasks without ever losing his faith. He always followed your son, the true king. He led a humble life, sincerely loving the poor and giving himself heart and soul to the search for peace. And even when his life was in danger, he trusted in you, putting his life in your hands. Almighty and merciful God, by the intercession of blessed Emperor Carl, we pray that you may give us his unconditional faith to support us in our most difficult situations, and the courage to always follow the example of your only Son. Open our hearts to the poor and strengthen our commitment for peace within our families and among all peoples. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Well, join me tomorrow for day six in our novena to blessed Emperor Karl, the Peace Emperor, and don't miss a day of prayer with us.